Um, she is a senior program officer there and um, works particularly, uh, or is here particularly, to talk about um, opportunities that are connected to digital liberal arts um, or digital humanities. And for those of you who might not know, those two uh, terms are sort of interchangeable. Um, the NEH uh, tends to use digital humanities and the Mellon Foundation tends to use digital liberal arts, but you'll hear those terms kind of used interchangeably. Um, today. So we're delighted to have Jennifer here to talk to us um, about applying for grants, what kinds of opportunities are available for us, and other ways that we might partner with the NEH um, in projects, not just that we have, but also projects the NEH has. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Jennifer, for making time oh. to come and be with us today. Absolutely. I, I'm delighted that McAllister College agreed to host this. Um, uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting um, uh, disruption in our lives um, has really affected us all. And I was mentioning before we formally began that usually NEH staff go out on the road to do some of these um, events. We've moved them online. It's allowed us to reach many more folks in some ways, but I do miss the one-on-one um, -on -one discussions that I have, the informal um, between sessions discussions as well. But I am very thankful to Andrea and Ainsley for um, uh, for doing all of the back um, uh, back end logistics for this, um, for reaching out, saying we'd be happy to host. And I'm also um, delighted that we have participants. Um, uh, in addition to McAllister faculty and staff um, from, from the surrounding communities, because that really, I think, speaks to the mission of the NEH. We want the humanities to be where Americans are, and that's everywhere. So um, uh, I'll, I'll be sort of touching on that. But as we get started, um, I, I always, um, I have this slide about the humanities and um, sometimes it seems funny that I do. We are, of course, you've, you found your way to this, um, this event, you know what the humanities are. But I do wanna mention that the endowment actually has a definition of the humanities that we use um, as part of our enabling legislation from 1965 through the National Foundation on the Arts and Humanities Act, which is um, the, the um, the legislation that started not only the NEH, but the NEA. Um, but if you take a look at this definition, it's extremely capacious. Um, it talks about um, uh, those aspects of the social sciences, which have humanistic content and employ humanistic methods, um, the study and application of the humanities to the human environment. Um, they also talk about the history and criticism and theory of the arts. So there is the lines between, rather, um, the National Science Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities in certain disciplines like anthropology, archaeology, linguistics can be quite blurry. The lines between um, the arts and the humanities, our sister agency, the National Endowment for the Arts, are also appropriately blurry. Um, and increasingly, the lines between the computer science work that the National Science Foundation does and the, uh, the, the types of digital humanities work that my office, the Office of Digital Humanities Funds, are quite blurry. The lines between what the National Library of Medicine does and what um, the National Endowment for the Humanities does in terms of supporting work in big data and ethical um, applications of big data to, to answer questions around the medical humanities or um, the history of medicine are blurry as well. And that's for the good, I think. Um, but I do wanna always remind folks that th this is the definition that we work for um, and work toward. So there are times when I get inquiries and I have to say, I'm sorry, I think what you're doing fits better with one of our sister agencies. But my goal is always to help you find the right funding agency for you. Um, but I don't want you to be discouraged if you think, oh, I'm not in the humanities. There's no space for me in the NEH. That may not necessarily be true. And part of what we'll be discussing today um, is um, the work of NEH over time and how we're organized now. So um, I do wanna sort of get a, a, a quick sense and I'm not sure I can see everyone's hands, but if you can use your hand um, raising feature, how many in this audience sort of have benefited from the National Endowment for the Humanities in some way. You've received a grant, maybe you've participated in a summer seminar or institute. Um, uh, 
So I'm seeing a few raised hands. Obviously, the Minnesota Historical Society. I'm glad to see someone here. You've been really great. Um, I did a double check last night. I will note, I expect to see everyone's hand raised, in part because you've probably read a monograph that was supported by NEH over the years. You've watched a documentary. You've attended a museum exhibition. You may have been a student um, or one of, uh, if you have children, one of, your, uh, one of your children may have benefited from a teacher who attended a summer seminar or institute and decided to stay into teaching because they were re-energized by the work that we've done. Which is to say, the ripple effects from NEH funded um, projects are both deep and wide. And that's something to keep in mind when folks say, oh, I don't think the NEH supports work that I benefit from. Well, for being such a small agency, you probably have benefited from it or um, your colleagues have, or your family members have, or frankly, the American people have, and that's important in and of itself. And if you haven't benefited now, you may in fact benefit from in the future. Let's talk about, let's get to the heart of the matter. You want to know about how could the NEH fund my work or fund my colleagues work, or I know someone who's working in the community and I want to know how they can fund that work, because that is actually what NEH does. We support work in the humanities across a range of different types of activities. And that's the way the NEH is organized. We are organized across seven program offices and divisions. Um, some are quite large, like our Division of Preservation and Access. Um, others are small, like my office, the Office of Digital Humanities. Um, and we do a range of activities. A lot of it has to do with, as you're sort of thinking about where do I fit within the NEH? It depends on what you need funding for, what stage of the project you're at, who's your audience for the project, and, wh um, and uh, where do you see, sort of see yourself in terms of output as well. Today, we're gonna be talking ab about a number of them. I wasn't planning to talk a lot about the Division of Public Programs in my presentation, but I do want um, you to feel free to ask questions about that in the um, group chat. We'll, we'll make sure that we cover that during the, the question and answer period as well. I could spend a whole 90 minutes talking just about the Office of Digital Humanities, but I'm not going to because even though my, um, my talk is somewhat digitally inflected, as I like to say, because I am in the Office of Digital Humanities, this sort of work happens across the agency. And that's something else to keep in mind. Um, your first stop at the NEH may not be your last stop. Um, and in fact, projects grow over time and start in one division, get funded in one division. The next stage may be more appropriately supported elsewhere. And that's something that um, we, want you, we want you to think about um, and to start, in, start, start to think how to plan for that as well. So I'm gonna jump right in um, and just sort of mention my, my uh, my point a moment ago about the, the work of the NEH supports digital projects across the agency. My colleague, Sheila Brennan, has done a wonderful blog post on the NEH website about how to find the various um, NEH grant programs that, that support digital work. And when we say digital work, we take a very capacious notion of that. Um, that includes digitizing collections. It includes developing a, a digital public uh, project. It includes very computationally intensive network analysis projects, for example. All of those fit comfortably within the umbrella of digital humanities, but that doesn't necessarily mean they would be funded by the Office of Digital Humanities. So I do spend a lot of my um, day helping people find the right NEH grant program that might support their digital project. So take a look at this wonderful blog post that my colleague Sheila has um, written. And I'll provide some examples as we go through um, the presentation about um, other digitally inflected projects that have been supported elsewhere in the agency. So you can see yourself within those divisions and offices as well. But um, for many of these uh, 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 workshops, uh, the audience is often faculty. So I do spend often, I often start with a division of research programs because that's often their first stop when they come to NEH. When folks say out in the wild, they're at a conference, oh, I have an NEH. They often mean I have an NEH fellowship. And in fact, that's one way of thinking about the division of research programs. They support scholars, both individuals and collaborative teams working on NEH research projects. And to get your mind around how the Division of Research Programs organizes themselves, it is they do sort of two types of, of funding opportunities, grants for individuals and grants for institutions. 
let's spend a little bit of time talking about grants for individuals. And in particular, um, I want to talk about the NEH Mellon Fellowships for Digital Publication, because that's a, it's a relatively new program um, that we actually do with the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, although we sort of manage the review process. And it's a sort of a sub area of our fellowships program. And it's a recognition that much of some scholarship today, I wouldn't say much, we're not there yet, but some scholarship today is appropriately expressed in a digital publication. And in fact, might only be able to be expressed in a digital publication. If you're incorporating sound or video or using a digital publication platform like Scalar as your final output, um, we um, there's an acknowledgement within NEH and within the Andrew Mellon Foundation that those, those sorts of projects the review panel may need a slightly different sort of uh, mix of expertise on the panel to be able to review projects not only about um, for the content of the proposal, but also the, the methods that are being proposed as well. So um, we've had a, um, for the last few years, a special Mellon Fellowships for Digital Publication program. So I want to make sure that that is on your radar screen. If that's what you're thinking about, we when I first started doing these these workshops in person um, ones and when the Office of Digital Humanities started to um, sort of take off, we did hear from faculty members saying, I want to do a project, I want to have a website as part of it, or I want to work with a university press um, that is getting a digital platform up and running. Um, but will NEH support that sort of work? And the answer was yes, but over time, we realized that that very question about the review process, if we weren't getting a critical mass of applications, it was becoming more difficult to review them. So now that we have a special program, we can appropriately tailor the review process. But make sure you take a look at the range of um, opportunities. And I know we did have a, a, a question about eligibility, um, and particularly those who are not US citizens. Um, each um, funding opportunity, the notice of funding opportunity details the eligibility for individuals and certainly US citizens, but also um, non-citizens who have lived in the United States for three years prior to application. It's a little, it's more detailed than that, but in the eligibility section of the notice of funding opportunities is where you'll find information. And that's generally true across the NEH programs for individuals. Um, but um, I will show you uh, as we're going through the, the talk about um, the discussion about the review process, sort of how to unpack a notice of funding opportunity as well. Um, but that is something to keep in mind is um, these are awards directly to individuals. So your, your institution doesn't apply. The money comes to you directly. It is generally for time, for research, for writing. Um, uh, you, you're doing this instead of teaching or you need it for summer salary. So um, the awards for faculty are um, for faculty at Hispanic serving institutions, historically black colleges and universities, and tribal colleges and universities, of which I know the, the final third category, there are a number of those in the state of Minnesota as well. Um, and it's a recognition that faculty at those institutions, which are often under-resourced, um, need a bit more flexibility in sort of how those can be supported. But um, if you're at McAllister, if you're at um, another uh, institution like McAllister, a small liberal arts college, the fellowships, the summer stipends, the NEH Mellon fellowships for digital publication, those are your individual award programs that you probably want to spend um, most time taking a look at. If you work on endangered languages, the dynamic language infrastructure documenting endangered language fellowships is a program that we do with the National Science Foundation as well. And once again, if you, if maybe not for you, if you know someone else who's working on these topics, let them know about these opportunities as well. If you would be our ambassador to those, uh, to those colleagues who are not here, that would be much appreciated. Um, and I just want to give you a sense of one of those projects that have been supported through the um, NEH Mellon Fellowships for Digital Publication. This is a project on sound. It's on um, hymns. It's on sacred tune books. Obviously, if you're doing a publication. Uh, on the sound project, wouldn't it would be much better if you could actually hear that sound, and that's um, that's a recognition that the these particular funding opportunities can support. So um, it, it's just getting underway. It just got underway last year, so there's not a final product yet. But it's an example of the types of projects that can be supported through that special funding opportunity for digital um, publication, and it's one that's right here in the state. 
Um, but I also wanted to, to give you a sense to, to acknowledge as I was getting ready for this talk, I was struck at how successful McAllister in particular had been over the years with the, the summer stipends program. Um, and this is an example of a fairly recent one. Now the summer stipends program for certain institutions, you need to be nominated and for certain types of faculty, faculty that are tenure or tenure track. Um, but if you're off the tenure track, if you are an adjunct faculty member, you don't need to be nominated by your institution. If you're an independent scholar, um, perhaps even an independent scholar working at a museum or historical society and you need time off for research and writing, the summer stipends program might also be for you, just like the regular fellowships program might be for you as well. Um, they are part of the milieu that makes up those who are doing work in the humanities and these individual research opportunities may be appropriate for you um, as well. But I always like to shout out um, to, uh, to an institution that is hosting us just to show sort of the range of success that your institution has. It doesn't always work, but this one, it worked really well. <laughs> um, I do wanna spend a little bit of time talking about the grants for individual or for institutions at the research um, uh, division as well in part because there's been some changes lately. Um, and so things you may thought you may have known about the Division of Research Program may have changed in the last year. Um, they have a, a new separate program called Ar Archaeological and Ethnographic Field Research. So if you're doing work in that space, if you need to do an archaeological dig, if you need to do ethnographic field work, including oral histories, these are collaborative research projects. So they're team efforts. Um, but that's a relatively new program. They, they've just had their first deadline um, previously. It's an expansion of what, when I first started at the NEH many, many years ago, we used to have a separate archeology span program. We now have the, uh, the archeological and ethnographic field research program. And that's, um, I, I wanna make sure that that um, is, I, is well known to you. It it's, takes a while sometimes for new programs to get out into the field and I wanna make sure that you all know about it. Particularly take a look at the definition of the types of activities it can fund. It's quite capacious in some ways. I also wanna bring your attention to the completely revamped collaborative research program. Um, last year is also, um, they, they did a complete rewrite of it. Um, what many of the things that used to be able to be funded through that program can still be funded. Um, things like convenings, things like planning for publications, collaborative publications, like um, uh, anthologies or edited volumes, but they now have a special tract for digital scholarly projects. Um, so you're not so interested in sort of the underlying infrastructure of the project. You're, you're really interested in using sort of doing a collaborative digital project using existing platforms and software. They also have a, a, a funding stream on planning for international collaboration. And I really like that. I think that's a recognition that um, uh, the humanities really do know no boundaries in terms of both subject matter and in sort of where it can happen in the world. And we as, um, uh, uh, oop, that's strange. We as, um, can you all see that on my screen? Can you see something sort of pale blue? That's really weird. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure why. I'm going to try to share again. Um, okay. uh, let's try this again. Here we go. It, it somehow brought my notes up um, and um, that was very strange. Um, but it, it's, an, it, it's an acknowledgement that um, this sort of, the work that happen, is happening in this space um, happens across um, um, and outside of the US uh, uh, sort of framework and that we as Americans benefit when we support that sort of work as well. So working with scholars, um, working uh, on subject matter, and it can be an American topic that benefits from scholars working from outside of the United States as well. Um, and this is an example of a project. Now this one was funded almost 20 years ago under the collaborative research program. But I will note that many of the activities that were supported here could still be supported in the collaborative research program, in particular that conference um, program. Um, and that, that field research, depending on what it was, I, we didn't even have the application, so I couldn't open up the application to preview it before this meeting. Um, uh, I would not be surprised if some of that field research could have been supported now through the archeological and ethnographic field research program. So um, I want to sort of give a sense of of the range of activities that can be supported by the division of research programs um, at the NEH. 
but I'm in the Office of Digital Humanities. I've been in that Office of Digital Humanities since it began. Um, I, I'm the third employee. I often joke about stock options being vested um, uh, uh, with my colleagues. The Office of Digital Humanities um, is about 14 year old, years old at this time, depending on when you date our, our, our starting. Um, we are an office that recognizes that work in the digital humanities reaches across the missions of the NEH. And at the time we began, um, it was a recognition that we needed to sort of identify the work that was already happening in the digital humanities at NEH, um, because there were pockets happening. And in fact, I came from the education division where there's a lot of exciting work happening, but there were also gaps. And we are that gap space. Um, it's also um, a recognition that we needed to have some attention to the underlying digital infrastructure that scholars, the general public use to engage with the humanities, to study humanities subjects, and to provide a space for that, those partnerships. So our office is the smallest in terms of funding um, that you'll hear about today. Um, but we do a lot of uh, 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 different things. And that's, I think, really important. The Digital Humanities Advancement Grant Program is meant to be incredibly flexible. And so this gives you a sense of the range of types of activities that can be supported. And it does include sort of the flip side of the digital humanities. People often say, oh, the digital humanities is the application of computational methods to the humanities. Well, in our office, we also say it's the contribution of the humanities and the work of humanity scholars to work in computational sciences. Um, the projects that we fund are on both sides of, of the coin that is the digital humanities. We're also known in our office for our support of international collaboration. Um, the digital humanities are incredibly international. So you will often see partnerships um, or short grant programs that support that sort of work. And our projects that we fund often have international collaborations as part of it. Maybe sort of begun with a workshop um, where they bring in international participants. Other times they're a team that's been working together for a long time, but they've identified a discrete project that they want to work on with funding from NEH. And NEH across our programs can support scholars um, on teams that uh, those scholars can be from outside of the United States. It's more difficult when we have institutions from outside of the United States. Um, it's, it's difficult to, to do sub awards to institutions outside of the United States, but certainly projects that involve collaborating scholars from both the US and outside of the US, they're quite eligible and sort of the consultant approach. Um, one hallmark of, in particular, of the Digital Humanities Advancement Grant Program is the three levels of funding. So if you're at the early stages, we're there for you. If you're at a more mature stage, we're there for you. And it also has two deadlines a year. And so that can help you with planning as well. Um, we ask you to choose one, either the January or the June deadline. Um, but we want to, to make sure that you um, uh, sort of we're there for you where you're at and when you're ready um, is often what I say. So, um, uh, so if you are sort of looking in this space, often people sort of take a look at the Digital Humanities Advancement Grant Program. Particularly, I want to encourage you if you're early stages in discussions um, for um, this sort of work. And this is an example of a project that um, the, um, is housed at McAllister, but working with um, Central College in Iowa. And it's to develop an open educational resource, but a really sort of innovative, experimental, creative one um, on German. Um, I, I love projects that are on sort of language learning. This will give you a, a, and it's a level two. So they had already started, they had some collaboration already in place, but they still needed some time to, to work on things. And that's what the, they weren't ready to do sort of broad distribution just yet. And this is sort of, they were exploring sort of what was possible. And um, this is an example of what the Digital Humanities Advancement Grant Program is able to fund. We want to explore sort of what's possible. The Advancement Grant Program also wants to sort of give space for, it may not work. Now this one is, that's not the case here, but um, we often uh, say that uh, you need to be intentional about not only your topic and your method, but your willingness to share with the field about the pathways that you went down. And that's why you'll see in some of our projects um, that have finished, there's public facing white papers um, to share with the field as well. And that's, that's sort of often in addition to 
other outputs, but the white paper lives on the NEH's website. It's, it's in some ways a, a version of your final performance report to us, but it's a recognition that the field needs to learn from, from what worked and what didn't work with you as well. I've worked at NEH for more than 20 years, and I know we may have, I, I have a feeling we've invented many wheels over the time, over the same time, because there was no meaningful way to share that result. So the applicants too, and the awardees in the Office of Digital Humanities <coughs> have to be willing to share sort of um, uh, their unproductive spaces, what didn't work with them. That's, that's something that's a sort of a pact you make when you, when you get an, um, an Office of Digital Humanities Award, you have to be willing to be public about your, your struggles as well. This is another example. This is one that was recently funded. Um, it's gotten quite a bit of media coverage um, as well, but it's a, it's a project that had sort of already had a track record and they really now wanted to sort of expand um, and, and bring in new parts of the United States. They were making it a national effort. Um, so, um, and one final one that was supported in the Office of Digital Humanities um, is one at St. John's College and really at the, the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, which is part of St. John's University, um, which is for um, uh, the, their VHMML um, project, which is to make available their amazing um, collection of manuscripts from around the world, often from quite endangered um, locations and over time. But what they needed funds for was to develop the platform that underlies it. So um, it really was sort of an infrastructure development. And because of the nature of the manuscripts, they had some particular challenges that they needed to grapple with. Um, some of the manuscripts were from uh, religious communities that um, had some questions about sharing it broadly. So they needed to figure out permissions levels and whatnot. Um, and that's, uh, that's something that is valuable not only to this project, but the, the field more broadly that are working with endangered um, or um, uh, responsible uses of, of certain types of, of collection. And that's why the white paper is um, just as valuable as the website um, that will hold the, the, um, the collections. And certainly that also means having a nice stable underlying platform means that you can go out and continue to add the collections even after the award period ends. I also want to talk a little bit about our Institutes for Advanced Topics in the Digital Humanities because this is where we grow the field. And every year we have new slates of proposals um, and projects that we fund. These are, um, and they're across the Digital Humanities. So if you're in archaeology. You may want to participate in this one offered by the University of Arkansas. If you're interested in doing a crowdsourcing project, maybe you're working with um, uh, a local uh, 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 museum or archive that has digitized their collections, but they're manuscript collections and they're not really great for um, optical character recognition. So you need to think about how do you develop a crowdsourcing transcription project so you can attend one of the workshops um, offered by the University of Minnesota working with the Zooniverse platform. If you're doing hardcore natural language processing or text analysis, um, workshops uh, and seminars offered by Princeton or the Santa Fe Institute or Ithaca Harbors, um, they may be for you. I will note, if you don't see yourself here, if you don't say, oh, none of these appeal to me now, come back next year. There may be something there in the future. These change every year. Increasingly, these are offered online or in a hybrid version where you meet online and then you meet in person or you meet in person and then you continue your discussions online. It's a way of building communities around methodologies within the digital humanities. And I, I stole this sort of the importance of professional development and continuing professional development from my colleagues in the Division of Education programs where I worked because I could see how transformative that work is. Communities are so important in the humanities, um, particularly in the digital humanities where sometimes you're the only person on your campus working in this space or in a particular discipline. But let's pop over to the Division of Education programs because they also do work and have a range of funding opportunities that can support work with, with what might be called the digital liberal arts or projects that bring in collaboration with community-based organizations as well. And I'm going to start with the Humanities Initiatives Program, in part because it's the most capacious of, of the uh, funding opportunities in our Division of Education programs. Um, strengthen the teaching and study of the humanities at institutions of higher education. Um, course curriculum development, community partnerships, uh, 
how can you strengthen the student experience in the humanities? They have an enormous range of activities that can be funded. And just last year, um, they expanded the program to not only do ones for community colleges, for Hispanic serving institutions, HBCUs, tribal colleges. Now they have a very broad one on colleges and universities. So I, I want you to see uh, McAllister and related institutions in that space as well. Um, and, and that may not be as widely known as some of those, um, the, the previous sort of separate funding streams for the Humanities Initiatives Program. The Humanities Connections Program is a great um, funding opportunity, particularly for projects that might fit under that digital liberal arts um, uh, category. Um, because the requirements for that, it's really focused on undergraduate education at two and four year institutions. But it, the requirement for this program is one program or department outside of the humanities. So often when the humanities talk about interdisciplinarity, they're talking about, oh, the history and the literature department are going to get together. And that's really productive sometimes. But sometimes it's also productive when the history department works together with the engineering department to talk about the history of public works programs or when a nursing program at an institution gets together with the, um, uh, uh, the philosophy program to talk about the ethics of care um, and to think about how to incorporate that into undergraduate education. And so this is the program that can bring faculty members together to talk about uh, and to make those connections. And these are examples. This is a, a program that offers both planning and implementation uh, funding. And here are some examples. This is a Humanities Connection Planning Grant. Um, and it's one that um, is in Minnesota. And it's really focused on sort of the honors curriculum. Um, but it, it does include, um, uh, I, I really liked it because it talked about scientific, social scientific, and mathematical knowledge and reasoning um, in their specific social and cultural contexts. Um, I think that's a, a really way of bringing in folks who may not see themselves within the STEM community um, to, to see them, to bring them on board, um, but also to make sure that students who are in science or technology majors see the importance of cultural context in the work that they're doing and the ethical context of it as well. Um, we are strengthened as a country when um, uh, students who are majoring in those disciplines um, can take advantage of the work that's being done in the humanities as well. I also wanted to give you a sense of that humanities initiatives uh, program and how capacious it is. This is one that went to a tribal college in Minnesota, um, but it was really focused on, and, and the work that they did was to create a student podcast series um, for language learning. Um, and I thought that was really creative. Um, I loved it when this project was funded. I saw it on the awards list and I thought that's a really great use of NEH funds because it brings students into the creation of the humanities, but it's also working with scholars, working with community members. Um, I think that's um, a, a sort of a sense of the breadth of the humanities work that can be funded, but it was funded through the humanities initiatives program. And finally, I do want to um, give a, a, an acknowledgement to our summer programs at NEH, and that includes summer seminars and institutes, the landmarks of American history and culture. Um, increasingly, a number of these are virtual and online. And in fact, when the new notice of funding opportunities comes out, um, my sense in talking with my colleagues in that division is they will be even more flexible. If COVID-19 has, has taught us anything, it's that we need to have plans A, B, and C, and that um, sometimes moving to a more flexible option allows us to bring in new audiences. They maybe couldn't attend something for four weeks in the summer, but they might be able to um, uh, participate in one uh, that is uh, virtual. And that's something we learned early on in the Office of Digital Humanities. And I'm really glad to see it filter back into the, our, our longstanding summer program opportunities. Here's an example of a project um, uh, at another uh, uh, small liberal arts college in Minnesota. But it's one that's a digitally inflected one. And this is for K through 12 school teachers, which I think is particularly exciting but is um, uh, really focused on the content, but it's also using digital resources. Um, there's so many in the classical world, and I think that's exciting. Um, if you can't go to that space, how can you use the, 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 the research, the resources that some of them have probably already been supported by um, the National Nom for the Humanities and other programs to really think about it in the context of teaching and learning and teaching and learning for um, K through 12 uh, students um, and their needs. So 
If you are interested in sharing sort of your work and reaching out, either hosting a seminar institute for college and university faculty and graduate students, or one for K through 12 school teachers, I want to put the seminars and institutes program on your radar screen as well, not only as participants, but as attendees. And certainly the landmarks of American history and culture, for those of you who are from community organizations, they've really stepped up and hosted those landmarks of American history and culture ones. So they're a lot of work, but they're incredibly meaningful and valuable to not only the participants, but the host communities, because you're bringing in teachers from around the country as well. So I want to encourage you to, to think about what might be possible. And it is often the case that it's a community organization, a local historical society, sort of partnering with a college or university or faculty from those organizations as visiting instructors um, that makes it so valuable. So still humanities, always, always humanities content rich, but really sort of thinking about the importance of place-based learning. Um, and that's what a landmarks of American history and culture can do. I know we have some folks in the audience from um, from the libraries and from scholarly communications. I, I do wanna give a, a few comments about our, our funding opportunities from the Division of Preservation and Access. It's really a, a division that's focused on sort of collections and caring for their cultural resources. And sometimes that means cataloging and digitizing existing collections. Sometimes that means improving the physical environment that um, those collections live in. Sometimes it means working with community organizations to make sure that their collections are just as well cared for as the most well-resourced institution as well. So preparing for disasters. Certainly the last few years of fires, hurricanes, earthquakes have taught us the importance of disaster planning for, for cultural resources. And our Division of Preservation and Access has, has um, really taken the lead in supporting this across the country. Um, one word about a program that is often the most well known of, of those uh, funding, the many funding opportunities under preservation and access, which is about the development of reference resources and humanities collections that have many uses. So this is the, the program that does cataloging and making available, um, opening up the resources for use by researchers, by students, by the general public to do it to do with it what they will for various reasons. Sometimes the collections that are supported here and preserved um, um, in this collection become fodder for documentary films, for museum exhibitions, for student projects that show up in National History Day. So this is in some ways a foundational program. Um, this is a program that also offers two levels of funding both foundations, what they call foundations, which are really planning to really put in place a collaboration and implementation. And that's something um, that's true across the agency. If you're thinking about collaboration, get those, get those conversations started before you apply to NEH. You don't wanna say step one of my funded activities is to reach out to the community or to reach out to my fellow um, colleagues to see if they wanna work on that project. Come to NEH saying, we've had these conversations, we need more time, we need to bring in other collaborators, but we have a collaboration in place already. That's really important. And increasingly our panels are saying, are saying to us, if I see a project that says they are working with the community, they expect to see community members as part of the project team. It's not for the community, it's with the community. And that's true um, whether or not you're working with a community outside of the United States as well, or if you're working with a, a project to document a language, we expect to see um, issues of equity, issues of partnership, true partnership um, in all the NEH um, programs. But this is an example of a project that was comes out of the University of Minnesota, but includes partnerships, um, the University of Texas Rio Grande, um, the National Museum of Mexican Art, but it, and it's a planning award um, to talk about sort of the growth and development of Mexican American art since 1984. So they're planning an online portal, a federated collection, um, uh, and to think about sort of using existing metadata schema that are out there for art history, but also how they may or may not work for Mexican American art and um, uh, what uh, may need to change the field of art history as we bring these collections um, into the national conversation. So this is an example of sort of a research collection that will have many uses from scholars to the general public to students, but it's being developed with the Humanities Collections and Reference Resources Program. And finally, um, just some brief words about the Office of Challenge uh, programs. 
no one likes to fundraise or if you do you're a very very special person and we need to we need more of you out there um, but the office of um, challenge grant programs is our program to um, leverage our funds to increase the capacity of fundraising and to support really large scale projects in the humanities and that includes capital projects like um, renovating a library starting a physical digital scholarship center um, uh, building out um, a, a preservation laboratory for special collections um, it also can include equipment and software purchase it also, um, one of the categories is talking about infrastructure. This is an infrastructure program, but what sets, off, sets the Office of Challenge Grant Program apart is most of the other NEH programs, you come in and say, I want the NEH to give me money. This program, you come in and say, I want the NEH to give me money, and I'm gonna use that award to leverage external fundraising. And so you are promising to raise external funds to match the NEH funds. So it's a great way of, um, going to donors and saying, we have this NEH award, will you help us to match it to release those funds? So if you're in an institution that's uh, starting a capital campaign, make sure this program is on your radar screen, make sure the humanities are part of your capital campaign. If you're at a humanities um, first institution, keep the, the challenge grant programs uh, on your radar screen for specific activities that you may be undertaking. Many of you are already fundraising, um, and we want to, to make sure that it's been revamped in the last few years. So things that may have been supported in the past may not be eligible now, but activities that may not have been eligible in the past may be eligible now. So I want you to take, take a look at this program because it's, it's, it's fresh in some ways. And this is an example of a digital infrastructure project that you folks in the humanities should know about no matter what. It's called the Humanities Commons Project out of Michigan State University. But it's also an example of a digital infrastructure project. It started in the Office of Digital Humanities. They got early stage work um, supported from us. They built the infrastructure. They built a community around it. And now they're saying, and now we want to sort of raise additional funds to make sure that um, it can be supported in the long term. And that's what um, the Challenge Grant Program is meant to do, particularly for digital infrastructure projects. If there are folks that rely upon this um, platform, or a long-standing project to do their work and the field would miss it if it was gone. That's what the Challenge Grant Program is, is able to support. And one final word about sort of our sister agency, the Minnesota Humanities Center. Um, could folks sort of raise their hand or sort of um, virtually or otherwise? How many of you sort of know about the work of the Minnesota Humanities Center or have even worked with them um, in some capacity? Um, oh, I'm really, I really like when I see, oh great, I'm seeing some, some hands being raised. If you don't know about their work, get to know them. You are in a state, Minnesota, that has one of the strongest state humanities councils. I've been so impressed with the range of work that they do, and they've done some really great work in digital humanities as well. Some, some uh, indigenous mapping projects, which I think are really creative in a model for around the world, around the country, and frankly around the world. They also um, are always looking for um, faculty and staff, experts in the in the humanities, to be involved in their work, um, to work with their K through 12 programs, to work with their community conversations programs. Um, so sometimes you may be a recipient, sometimes you may be um, one of the experts on a project, sometimes you may be on the board of the Minnesota Humanities Center as well. Um, but it's another sort of funding opportunity, but it's also just a great institution to get to know. And it's a, for those of you who are working with students um, uh, who are looking for ways of working with their communities, some of the projects supported by the Huma Minnesota Humanities Center may be a great sort of entry point for sort of the humanities in the field, in the wild, for public humanities programming. Okay. So we've talked about a range of NEH funding opportunities and I'm a little bit behind schedule. I've gone a little bit um, too far, but now what, where do we go? You've sort of heard me give my spiel. You said, oh, I made a note about the fellowships program. I made a note about the digital humanities advancement grant program. Where do I go? Well, you start with our range of grant opportunities at the NEH. And if you go to neh.gov, um, at the very top of our website, there's um, uh, the, the header, 
has the link to grants. And whoever designed our website was smart enough to know that's often what people are coming for first. Yes, they love Humanities Magazine. Yes, they want to know when the, the next Ken Burns film will be broadcast on public television. But most folks are coming for grants. So click on the link that says grants, and this is what you'll see. Um, because this is what allows you to sort of search all of our grant programs, spend some time getting to know the various grant programs. Um, it's going to take some work. We have a lot. Um, I've only really given you a taste of, of um, a few. But every grant program, so once you uh, have identified a few grant programs, you want to click on um, the link to that particular grant program. Because we've tried over the years to really standardize sort of the look and feel of these landing pages, and I do call them landing pages, because on every page you will find sort of when the applications are available for the next competition, whether or not that program reads drafts, that's something to sort of keep in mind. A number of NEH funding opportunities read drafts. Um, and of course, we're always available for conversations, even if you don't submit a draft. When is the application due? And importantly, when is the project start date? Sometimes you need to work backwards from that to see if this project funding opportunity would even work for when you want to start um, funding. This is also where you'll find, and this is a very inside government baseball funding uh, uh, lingo, where the notice of funding opportunities is. These things used to be called guidelines. Um, but if you open up the PDF, this is where you will find instructions on who's eligible, what that particular program can fund, also what it can't fund. And it varies from program to program. Even some programs that support the digital humanities, there's some very sometimes picky details about which programs can fund um, uh, 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 equipment costs and which ones can't, which programs can support undergraduate researchers as a part of a team and which ones can't. Take a look at those notices of funding opportunities. Yes, they can be quite dense, particularly when you get to the sections about budget preparation, but you're not alone. You can work with colleagues on your own campus, on your, at your own institution. Many of them have expertise to help you unpack it. Read it a couple of times, make notes, use those highlighters, um, uh, use some post-it notes or virtual post-it notes. Get in touch with us, with us if you have any questions. If something seems unclear to you, that's what you pay me for. I, I work for you. Um, my job is to sort of clarify things for you. And if you can get to me before you submit an application, I can be much more helpful. If you wait until after you submit an application, I'm a little bit stuck and so are my colleagues. Um, if it's minimally eligible in the program, you're kind of stuck with it. Even if the project would be more competitive and more appropriate in an, another NEH program, um, we can't move them around. Um, and you really are not supposed to submit the same project activities under a number of different NEH funding opportunities. So you need to wait to hear, which is another way of saying, call us before you submit to make sure that your project um, would not only be eligible, would be, a, be competitive in that funding opportunity. We are not unaware that um, uh, preparing an NEH application is difficult sometimes. Some are relatively easy. Um, it's a five page application for a fellowship or for our smaller preservation assistance grants for smaller institutions. Others are incredibly dense and have a lot of moving parts. Um, let us help you sort of uh, learn how to navigate that. You'll also find um, uh, on these landing pages links to webinars for writing the applications. Technical assistance webinars is what they're called. You'll find frequently asked questions. You'll find samples of previously funded projects. Um, in, we're trying to put as much information as possible to help applicants um, uh, on these landing pages as possible. Um, when I first started at the NEH, you had to know to ask for a sample application. They were always available, but we didn't have a place to put them and to make them available. So you had to know. Um, and if you didn't know, you didn't know. But now we've just put them out. Um, and that we, we hope that's helpful to, to applicants um, uh, uh, as they're preparing an application. With one caveat, that application requirements change over time. So as you're using those samples, keep in mind that um, sections may have shifted around. We may require new sections. Sections may now be pulled out as a separate attachment. So we increasingly try to put on this introduction what's new for this recent competition. You, so you want to use those samples um, uh, thoughtfully and judiciously um, to help inform you as you're preparing your current application.
because you always want to follow the current guidelines. Much like you tell your students, it's in the syllabus. We try to get folks to focus on it's in the notice of funding opportunity what we're looking for. Um, and if it and if you submit an application that doesn't have one of the requirements, we're stuck. We have to rule you ineligible. Um, and and that that's always painful for us. Um, uh, because we know how much work that you've put into it. But if you're missing the work plan attachment, we're stuck um, and, and we don't want to rule you ineligible. So read very carefully and work with your Office of Grant Management on your own campus, your Office of Sponsored Research, your Office of Accounting. So as I was saying, we have lots of available resources available. Um, my office, we try to highlight funded projects. If you apply and are not funded, or even if you apply and you are funded, you can get your reviewer comments to help you decide sort of where you want to go next. So um, these are just uh, some of the available resources that we have available. I, I really like these webinars and how-to videos that are increasingly becoming available, um, particularly because they're often focused on a particular funding program. So they can go much more in depth than I could in, in my first part of my um, discussion. There's also the database of funded projects. And I'll tell you a little bit later, I'll show you where you can find this database. And in fact, this is the database that I use to find the examples that I incorporated in my earlier presentations. Um, this is also where you can find links to those white papers, links often to the products, a, 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 a catalog entry, um, a link to a website for the project that was supported by um, the National Endowment for the Humanities. It's also a great way to find collaborators for your project. Um, uh, who's already done work in this space. In the Office of Digital Humanities, in our applications, we require an environmental scan in our applications. Who else is doing work in this space? This is not the only place that you should search for, it, but it's not a bad place to start um, uh, to see uh, who's also doing work in this space. Maybe they want to be a consultant on your project, or maybe you want to um, submit an application where they're a co-PI to sort of build on their work. Um, it's also um, a, a place that you can um, uh, uh, sort of uh, find out sort of who on your campus is doing this sort of work. If you want to go touch base with them, oh, I see you got a summer stipend in 2018. Would you be willing to read my application? There are often writing circles on campuses for those uh, institutions that submit lots of applications to the NEH fellowships program, for example. Find out who else on your campus has been successful and use that database of funded projects um, uh, to identify those folks. And um, those, those additional sorting options are a, a really great way of sort of delving even more deeply into, um, uh, into this database. And every day as people upload sort of more links to their media coverage, to their products, to their prizes, it becomes richer and richer. Um, and I like that. Um, so it's not just a static list of who got awards, but it's a static list of, um, or it's a, it's a, a non-static uh, database that um, is, uh, uh, grows in time um, with the value. But as you're writing your application, I always want to say a few words about evaluation criteria. And this is really for illustration only. I'm in the Office of Digital Humanities, so I chose the one for the Digital Humanities Advancement Grant Program. But the point is that as you're preparing your application, as you're working with your colleagues to prepare an application, you want to make sure you're writing toward that evaluation criteria. And you'll notice when you start to open up the notices of funding opportunities, we have increasingly keyed the review criteria to the different sections of the application so that you know how, where to address the various review criteria in the different parts of the application. And I think that's really valuable. We always did that um, in our own minds at the NEH. We didn't have a, a random review criteria. It was always tied to the application. But we're trying to provide road paths um, or, or, or pathways for the applicants um, to see, oh, if I'm addressing the, um, the, the qualifications of the, the key staff or project con uh, contributors, I really should do it in the staff section. So I'm addressing criteria four in the staff section of the application. Um, but each program has different review criteria because each program has different missions. They often start with the intellectual significance um, in the humanities. We are the NEH, of course. Um, if a project, no matter how amazing it is, is not strong in the humanities, if they haven't made the case for the humanities, doesn't mean it's not a good project. It may mean that it's not a good project for the NEH. So make sure you can answer that question in whatever program you're applying to the NEH for. But um, make sure you also then let it flow from there to find the right funding opportunity. And of course, across the agency, we use the same review scale. So when you, if you do apply and get your grades back, 
these are what you'll see. But we always tell applicants and we tell our panelists as well, grades are important, but the comments are um, even more so. Um, so you'll see excellence and very goods and goods. Um, but those grades can mean different things to different panelists and even within different disciplines. Um, so uh, that's why uh, I have this slide. But because I can't show you an example of the review of the um, actual panelists' comments, um, it's a bit disassociated. But the grades are important because they are signals sort of of priority. So usually the funded projects have a preponderance of excellence and very goods. But more importantly, that's um, also where we sort of try to identify what are some uh, pain points? What are things we need to be aware of? There are no perfect projects. Even projects that have all excellence can be improved. And that's where being a peer reviewer um, becomes really important. And the role of the peer review in the NEH process for making awards is incredibly important. So a few things to keep in mind. Um, I, I, I've stressed this a couple of times. Make sure you find the right grant program. Um, if you haven't found that, we're, we're stuck. Make sure you know about grants.gov. And that may just may mean knowing who at your institution is responsible for submitting your application via grants.gov. If you're an individual, it may be you. You may need to register. If you're um, submitting an institutional or organizational application, it's probably someone in your Office of Sponsored Programs or um, if you're at a cultural institution, someone in your accounting office or federal relations office. Um, uh, you, if you're the project director, you probably won't be the person responsible for submitting it. Um, but make sure you know who is and make sure they know that you're coming at them <laughs> with an application from NEH before the deadline. Do not show up on deadline day and say, here, can you submit this application on my behalf? because they are often the folks that are also help you prepare the budgets um, and make sure that you're following not only institutional policies, but also federal policies um, for certain issues as well. Of course, we talked about reading the guidelines and the samples, um, contacting a program officer. Um, I'm one of many um, uh, that are available to help you. If you're not sure where to go, you can always get in touch with me. Um, I can refer you to the right program. I might even be able to refer you to a specific person within that officer division as well. Um, we're still a fairly small federal agency. So um, even though we're working apart, um, we still stay in touch with each other. We had a big post Thanksgiving lunch um, because the day after Thanksgiving is not a federal holiday. So those of us who are working that day, we all got together on Microsoft Teams to reconnect, which is to say that I know my colleagues um, and I am happy to put you in contact with them. Something to always keep in mind, always remember your audience. And that may mean a very small audience. There's not a lot of folks who can read cuneiform. We still do a lot of projects in cuneiform because we are the space for it. Um, but there are also projects that are about the US Constitution. So that's a pretty big audience. So make sure you are, you're very specific in your application. Who's the audience for your particular project? And why is it important for that audience? And how can you make your project meaningful also for the generalists who are reading the, the application? Avoid jargon. Now there's a difference between, I always say between jargon that's impenetrable and technical language. Some projects need very technical language. My division works with projects that have a lot of technical language. Making sure you run your application by sort of a non-specialist might help you to um, sort of make um, those distinctions. And some of these technical language just needs an example after it. And that's why using those concrete examples can really help to unpack technical language um, um, in certain uh, projects. Um, demonstrate that you're the right team in place or you're the right person. Um, and that's also why sort of that sharing, um, working with uh, collaborators, working with um, colleagues on your own campus or elsewhere um, to anticipate and answer possible concerns. And that's why you always turn back to the review criteria as well. Have I addressed all the review criteria? What are my plans for contingency and risk mitigation? If you're proposing a convening, um, what are your plans for what happens if we have, oh gosh, please not a, a fourth wave of, um, of the pandemic and all of our best laid plans for meeting in person um, have to go by the wayside again. What are your plans for that? Um, include that in your application. Budgets. Institutional applications, collaborative applications have budgets. Um, individual applications, you're just buying time of an individual. So it's month by month. But for budgets, 
you often have um, uh, some funds for uh, staff salaries, some for travel, some for student workers. Um, uh, they can be complicated and it's not something that um, we often have training for in our own work in the humanities. But there is probably someone at your institution on your campus who has this special advice or that special expertise, go to them for advice. The notice of funding opportunity is pretty dense. If you're not sure, um, call us, ask them know what is and isn't allowed for that particular program. Um, and this is also where I say talk to your sponsored research program or sponsored research pro uh, program early in the process. Um, they can help you understand your various indirect cost rates. What does indirect cost rates support? Um, uh, they can sort of work backwards from planning your budget to make sure you can do what you're proposing. Um, I, it's always heartbreaking when I get a call the day before the application with someone who I've read a, a, a draft for but not seen a, a budget for um, and they say oh I just learned our indirect cost rate is 40 percent and so I have to take 40 percent of my project off the table what should I do and I'm at that point I'm a little bit stuck so find out those uh, get that advice early in your planning for the project it may sort of give you a sense of where the funds can go there may also be other pockets of support at your institutions that can support, say, the student worker aspect of it. Um, and that can be included as cost sharing on the budget as well. Um, they can still be involved in the project, but the funds may be paid for from another pocket of funding. Um, and that's okay as well. They can help you navigate sort of all those options. Um, and sometimes there may be more options that, um, than you know about. Um, so uh, uh, bring in those folks, they're professionals, they have that expertise, um, bring them into the conversation. Just like you're bringing in the librarians, the technical experts for your data management components for your sustainability plans, bring in the folks for to help you prepare the budget as well. I know this seems silly, but I, I do need to sort of uh, reinforce this, pay attention to details, make sure you include those required supporting materials, um, proofread because your, your peers are gonna be reading this and it can be very distracting if it's riddled with errors or if they say um, in an application, I'm applying to the American Council of Learned Societies for support for this and they're applying to the NEH. Um, that's always, it's heartbreaking. We know it's not uncommon, but it's, um, so make sure you do those find and replaces before you submit the applications to us. Um, uh, uh, those, are, uh, those are sometimes simple things that can doom an application. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and that's heartbreaking in some ways. So you submit the application or you have someone submit the application on your behalf and you're like, where does this go? What is this black hole that I just submit for? Here's a sense of why it takes so long for the NEH to get back to you with the response. Because we, we are a federal government agency, every application that's determined to be eligible goes through the review process. Um, we have our peer reviewers. We try to give our peer reviewers, which are you all, um, enough time to review the, the projects thoroughly, carefully, to convene panels if necessary. And we need to then prepare the staff recommendations. Often it means we have more good projects than we have support for. Some of our programs have 10 and 15% funding ratios. That's tough um, to decide which ones then are recommended for support to the National Council on the Humanities, which meets three times a year. They just met last month. And then by law, our chairman makes the final decisions. Um, but that person, whoever that person is, relies upon the, um, all of the earlier advisory work, and in particular, the peer review process. So I will show you, um, we're coming to the end, but I'll show you where, if you're interested in serving as a peer reviewer, um, it's very valuable. Um, as part of the process. It's a, a bit of a behind the scenes what happens, um, but it also gives you a sense of what a good application looks like and what an almost good application looks like and what a not so great application looks like. And that can be valuable too. Um, what are the crucial components that sometimes are missing or if they just talked a little bit more about something. And so serving on a peer review panel, an NEH peer review panel can strengthen your ability to um, submit strong applications in the future as well. So, you find out the results of the competition that you submitted to six months ago. You get an email from us. You got an award, congratulations. This is amazing. We, those, the three days a year that we get to give out that good news to folks are some of the happiest days at NEH because um, uh, we, we know how much work went into preparing that application. We also though, 
the day before we tell everyone who got an award, we tell those who didn't get an award. And those are some of the, the most difficult days um, because we know how important NEH funding is to some of these projects. So take a few days if you're not supported, grieve, be really angry at us. Sometimes I'm angry at us too because we don't have enough money to support all the good projects. Then request your reviewer comments. So just send an email back to us saying, can you please send me your comments? Read those comments, contact a program officer. We're happy to talk to you about it. We can talk about whether or not it's appropriate to revise and resubmit, or if it's another program that would be more appropriate, or if as the project progresses, are you ready for a different stage of the funding? So yes, be disappointed, but please don't be so disappointed or discouraged that you give up on NEH. Um, the NEH will still be here. Sometimes it takes two or three times to submit an application before it's supported. In my office, our record is six times. Um, and boy, we were really happy, although we had to have a poker face um, when that final, um, when the chairman finally recommended that one. Um, but they benefited from 25 anonymous peer reviewers before they got to the stage that was supported. Um, and so that's really, that persistence paid off. The project was better than it was um, when it first was submitted a few years ago. Um, it was stronger, it was more appropriate. Um, and but the project still had uh, still was, was valuable and was successful. I know a couple words about the CARES Act and NEH and COVID-19. Um, if you have a current award or if you're unsure about um, sort of what COVID-19 means for your project, um, uh, we've put some language on the NEH website. Um, here's the link, but I'll also show you where you can find it on the NEH website as well. We've given a lot of extensions. We actually got some additional money from Congress in the previous CARES Act, um, which was great for us and totally unexpected. So smack dab in the middle of uh, sort of our quick move uh, to work from home, we had money to give out to the community and that was amazing. And Minnesota did quite well as a, as a state. Um, there's a number of projects that were supported under that and that was to support jobs in the humanities. And that that was really meaningful. Um, and um, a number of those projects are coming to an end or about to end. Um, there has been some discussion about additional funding for a CARES Act II. I don't have any more information than I think the general public has, but if we do have additional funds um, to give out um, related to COVID-19 or CARES Act II, you'll find information on the NEH website about that. And we'll do our best to get the word out to the community about that as well. All right, so I've thrown a lot at you. I really have, I know. Um, but I really want you to keep up with what NEH is doing, what our activities, what our special initiatives, what our events are. So make sure that you, your colleagues know what you're interested in so they can keep an eye on any announcements from NEH, 